Hello, everybody, and welcome on our Instrument Reprocessing Requirements Assessment and Choices for Future webinar. I'm Evelina Kozo from Practice Support, and today I will welcome Margaret Jennings, microbiologist and leading educator on infection prevention control in primary health. Before we start, I would like to I would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of this nation. We acknowledge the traditional custodians and sovereign people of the land across which we work. We recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and community, and pay respect to elders past, present, and emerging. I would like to welcome Margaret Jennings to our webinar. All yours, thank you. Thank you, Evelina, and welcome everybody. Now, I look a bit different maybe to the last time you saw me, and this is called chemo hair. And early last October, I was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. I'm in remission and I feel good. I will be retiring at the end of September, um, but it's fantastic to be able to do this today. Um, I was invited and did assist the RACGP as part of a working group um, last year on reviewing um, the guidelines. Uh, in fact, they were called the standards then for RACGP, and we've now called them the guidelines. So I would really hope that with today's session, which is really about exploring and which way am I going to go and what do I need to do regarding device instrument reprocessing. So today's a bit of a decision um, fireside chat for um, a lot of practices, a lot. I mean, my personal view is probably 75% of practices will choose not to reprocess their instruments. That, that's my view. Um, I guess everybody is, is talking about, oh, do I need to get a washer disinfector? I actually want you to think about a lot of other things before we even get to that. The second session, which we'll do later, is more about how do I now proceed now that I've decided to reprocess. So today's a bit of exploring, a bit of a, a fireside chat, and I will talk about the requirements. I'll talk about how you might assess which way you're going to go, what makes sense. Should I go fully disposable? Should I continue to reprocess? And a lot of that has got to do with your turnover and then your choices for the future. In the second session, which is, is later, um, it will be more about now I've decided that I am going to proceed, how do I do it? So that's that's the second session. So there are a, a lot of key words in this, but just, I think, sit back and relax and say, how am I going to make some sense of what is happening? But the first thing I need to say is there is no, uh, how can I put it? no serious, um, although we've done some updates, there's no big changes. And that actually surprises a few people because they said, oh, I thought I had to do this. And I go, well, actually, please go to the online version of the RACGP guidelines for infection prevention control and for instruments or reprocessing of medical devices. Please go to section 10. I think before anybody goes on to the next session that we're going to do, please go to section 10, which is about the reprocessing. And there you will find, in a way, not so different to what was in the, you know, uh, the last version, but I think a real focus on these are the things we need to be getting right. Have we got, and it's a must, you know, we've got to have a dedicated area for instrument reprocessing. The days of doing it just at the sink, you know, the same one that you do your hand washing to prepare for an excision, just really not on. Real, I've really got to push people on to the next stage rather than them just deciding, oh yeah, we're, we're going to keep processing. So I'm really going to get people to look at the requirements today and uh, how you might navigate your way through there. And also there is a way in section 10, there's a sheet of how you can compare disposable and reusable, the costs all the way through. So uh, I want to talk about that. And I was able to help develop that. Um, and the RACGP have put that in as an example. 
and then yes, your choices for the future and really what you can do now. So there is a lot of improvements that we can do while we're deciding. So let that be today, our fireside chat. So first of all, um, why do we not just talk about instrument sterilisation? So we've changed the terminology a bit to the reprocessing of reusable medical devices. And whilst we say, you know, take everything to the steri room or the reprocessing area, you'd be saying, but I've got to clean the pulse oximeter. Do I have to take that? No. So we're already cleaning things in the surgery, in the consult room. Uh, you can call them clinical surfaces if you like, but um, yeah, devices like the pulse oximeter, um, you know, the wipe over, the scales, you know, the, the clean over. So things that we're not taking for a, a full wash, sure. So we actually do do, if you like, that sort of reprocessing um, at the point of use. But I'm really talking today about items that do come to the reprocessing um, area. So I think just sort of saying devices, yep, yeah, that does include all of those other things, you know, wiping over the, um, the thermometer, even though you're using a disposable piece to go on top of it. And I also wanted to, I guess, for people who are not sure about, you know, I don't want to use disposables, they're unenvironmental, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to actually buy into that argument um, because I think there are swings and roundabouts. Um, sometimes people get obsessed about uh, thinking that a, dispose, a, a reusable instrument is always going to be better than a disposable one, but I'm actually going to tell you about disposables as well, how they're made and, uh, and the costs, but also the costs for reprocessing. And I think a lot of people know what they are and they're about um, having resources, having space. Um, I mean, if I was to pick a wild figure out of, the, um, out of the air and somebody said, I want to really get stuck into reprocessing and but we actually need to have a separate room, how much is all this going to cost? You know, the answer is thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars by the time you get a steriliser, you know, all your benches put in, um, no grout, you know, splash back all smooth, um, everything smooth, purpose built, not to be shared with linen, or um, what are some of the other things people want to use? Storage, people often say, oh, this room looks so empty, the reprocessing area. Can't I put my rubbish bins in here? Can't I put my stores in? No, you can't. It's always a really bare room. So uh, the requirements, I think the one that people aren't taking enough notice of, which is there and has really sort of been there, but we're really trying to get staff to focus on, managers to focus on, is you really do need a separate space. You've really got to have a separate space. The, uh, the days of sharing it with other things are just not on. Now, essentially this means having a separate room, um, but at this point, I would say just if you are sharing it with some other area, just stop. You know, really come to terms with that. Um, if I was to say to you that when we're manually cleaning an item, scrubbing it and then rinsing it, the splash goes out about a metre onto the walls. So if they're tiled, the grout will hold that contamination onto the other benches. So if your steriliser is right next to your sink, it's getting contaminated every time you, um, you rinse an instrument. So you can now see that the processing, the reprocessing area is not just a tiny little, you know, double sink with, you know, a steriliser at one end and a... Um, you know, a sitting down area, the other. It's it's a, a bench that continues on for some metres. If you also have a look at the area that you're reprocessing at, you wouldn't be having paper towel and gloves and uh, any hand wash or anything at that sink. Remember, everything has been contaminated every time I manually scrub and rinse that instrument. So I am talking in the present, but most of us are manually cleaning instruments. Very few people have got washer disinfectants at present. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about the history of the washer disinfector and why it's um, landing on our shores in general practice. So think about that space. And for some people, that's their, their first decision. Do you know what? I'm not going to proceed with um, 
processing instruments because we just don't have any space. We certainly don't have a separate room and currently we're sharing. So for some people that decision is now beginning to be made and it's, it's really actually not that new. In terms of the washer disinfector, which is what everybody wants to talk about, if you have a look at the, there are bench top models and there are ones that go in under the bench. Um, I avoid talking about them as though they're dishwashers. They're not dishwashers. But why? Why are people talking about washer disinfectors? Well, remember with the steriliser, when we do sterilising, we actually have what we call a validated process. In other words, we check that the steriliser is actually working. You know, we, we look at the printout and check that it's within the parameters described that we that are required and we can validate we can confirm and prove that's what validation means we can confirm and prove that steriliser is working but we don't really have that at present for cleaning well in fact we do and that's what the washer disinfector does so I'll give you a contrast so when you and I go to wash or clean scrub an instrument um, we've got our little warm water set up with the correct detergent, hopefully diluted correctly. But then there's the first thing, we're a bit sloppy with the way we might dilute it. We sort of fill something to the line and we pour something else that's measured to the best of our ability. But even the dilution of the detergent we, isn't really as accurate as it could be. The temperature of the water, well, it just depends on, you know, what comes out of the tap after sort of 20 seconds. We don't really worry. Right, so even that's not controlled. And then how long I scrub for? Well, it depends who I'm, I shouldn't be talking to anybody else while I'm doing this, but I'm in a hurry. You know, it's going to get four seconds or oh, I've got all day. It's going to take 20. So that's not controlled. Um, also, when I check it to see that it's clean, I've just got my eyesight and, you know, some of us wear glasses and some of us have got better eyesight than others. So that's not controlled. And then I rinse it under warm to hot running water. Well, that might be two seconds, it might be five. So that's not controlled. Whereas if I have a washer disinfector, I put in the detergent in the little dosing space and it delivers a set amount of detergent. It operates at a known temperature, that's controlled. It operates for a particular amount of time, that's controlled. I load the instruments in there according to a, a process that's controlled and then it rinses and the best thing about a washer disinfector I think everybody knows is it has a drying cycle so everything comes out dry. So why was the washer disinfector um, introduced certainly the hospitals the day procedure units it's now mandatory and the dentist it's becoming mandatory there the washer disinfector it is more, I guess, certain the outcome of getting a clean instrument. And, you know, we've always hung our hat on um, um, a dirty instrument that goes into the steriliser. Um, no guarantee that it can be sterilised. Um, one other little part of the washer disinfector is you can um, do a little test, at what we call a soil, um, a soil load test, uh, where you put a little slide in a slot and take it out and examine it. And it can tell you, I think there's a machine that does that for you. And it can tell you that yes, you know, the protein residue, et cetera, uh, was removed um, in this particular load. So you can see that um, general practice has, has been sort of at the end of the um, group of professions there or facilities, healthcare facilities. And uh, right now, right now, this very in instant, there is something else happening. So we've got in front of us the RACGP guidelines that says it's still okay to manually clean until we receive, and I think it's going to be August, September this year, at the national level, the Australian standards are determining whether it's going to be mandatory to do a mechanical clean rather than a manual clean. So I think you'll see in the RACGP guidelines, there's a little uh, sentence there that says, while this is the current um, yeah, acceptable method, the manual clean, we're all waiting to see what will go into the final um, edition 
of the Australian standard, which is for all instruments in all healthcare facilities. And if they mandate that it's only suitable to manually clean in certain circumstances for certain instruments, then that would make the washing disinfector um, compulsory. To be practical and realistic, there would be a time frame given for practices to, uh, to achieve that. Now, having said that, let's move into, so I've talked a little bit about the requirements and the requirements essentially that I think affect a lot of practices, and it's been like this actually for some time, is that you really do need a dedicated area. And so for some people, that's gonna take time to work out. For the others, it's going to be, well, actually, um, should I keep on uh, reprocessing? What should I do? And I did mention that in my view, just my opinion, probably 75% of practices will go to disposable. So how would we make that decision? And I did suggest that in section 10, in the RACGP guidelines that came out um, late last year, early this year, that in section 10, there's that little chart and it says, you know, do you want to go disposable? For this item, it might be a vaginal spec, do you want to stick with reusable? And it's costing. Now, I haven't put in the cost of the item because only you know the cost that you purchase either the disposable or the reusable for. But I've alerted you to parts of the assessment that people might not think about. Often all people think about is the cost, but I've put in you know, labour time, and yes, if you're sort of doing 15 instruments at lunchtime and you know how long that takes, then you can apportion, you know, a fraction to, uh, to each item. So I've, I've put, um, think about time if you're reprocessing. Um, think about even, and I may not have put this in the chart, think about the quality of the instrument. And I think it is a good chance now to have a look at your reused instruments Oh, can I say, please do not reuse a disposable item. You'll go to jail for that. <laughs> or sorry, I would encourage, um, you know, that there be a very severe penalty. And if you do use a um, disposable item that's used for a procedure, um, you know, there's probably going to have to be some disclosure, even if it's by accident, um, because these items cannot be cleaned. They have not been validated for cleaning nor sterilising. And that's a, a fairly stern warning from me. Um, please know if you have items in your practice and you actually don't know if they're disposable, get on to the person who supplied them. Uh, please, and I have been involved in a court case regarding this, where the actual person uh, distributing them said, oh, it's okay to clean them, which was you know, shock horror. So do not reuse an item that is labelled disposable. Okay, use it once, and if it's metal, it goes into the sharps container, you know, if it's got sharp points. So that leads to the other issue. There is a waste issue um, or a waste component for disposable items. Um, I mentioned that there was one column that we might not have provided for, but I can tell you what to do, and that is to, if you are certain you're going to go and keep on reprocessing, please have a look at the state, the integrity of your instruments right now. And so that's about saying anything with rust, sorry, cannot use. Because rust produces a rough surface on the item, on the, um, you know, the forceps or whatever, and you can't clean a rough surface adequately. It's a bit like our benches. As soon as you get rough bits, cracks in them, you cannot clean them properly. So have a look at the instruments right now. And that gives you a bit of a clue even as to how you're going to go. Now, the prices of instruments vary. These are the reusable instruments. And people will say, oh, look, um, it's ridiculous throwing out the disposable scissors. You know, they're one or two or whatever, $1.50, $2.50 each. Um, you know, we can get reusable ones for $12. Well, have a look at the quality of the $12 ones. If they're rusting every, you know, three months and you've got to throw them out, there's probably no savings there. You can also get fabulous scissors for $70. So have a look at the integrity um, of the instruments you've got. Are the points meeting? 
uh, the instruments where um, the doctor or the nurse opens the pack and finds out, oh, here are these scissors that don't join or they're curved, you know, they've got a bit curved or damaged and they continually come back to you in the process, reprocessing area unused. Time to get rid of those. So I would say have that culling, um, get rid of rust, rusting instruments, avoid, you know, buying instrument milk and trying to, you know, rust is really caused by instruments remaining wet. Um, you know, not being dried thoroughly or something like that. So get rid of rusty instruments, get rid of those that don't join, get rid of ones that you don't use. Some of you are storing items that haven't been used in a year. I think it's time to get those out and say to all the um, clinicians and nurses, why are we even hanging on to this? Because all we're ever doing is just reprocessing them after a set number of months uh, because they can deteriorate, the packaging can deteriorate. So assessing is also if I decide to reprocess, if I've got, you know, I'm going to continue reprocessing reusable instruments, I've really got to think about all the things I have to buy to keep doing that, uh, you know, which are the pouches or the flexible packaging, which is the detergent, uh, which are the brushes, you know, replacing the brushes every few months. Um, and then the, I guess we call them the consumables. And then there's what we call the um, maintenance. So I've got to be, you know, obviously cleaning the item. Um, I've got to be testing uh, my sterilizer, obviously, and uh, paying to have that done each year and the validation. So a lot of you immediately can say, well, if I'm going to keep reprocessing, um, what was my last bill uh, for the, um, the service technician to come and, and how much did we pay for that? So that can be anywhere between, you know, $500 and $1,000. Um, how old is your steriliser? Um, I'm assuming that it's compliant, that it dries with the door closed and that you get your little printout and that it prints adequately, you know, that it's time, temperature and, and pressure. Um, is it ready to sort of, or is it going to pack up soon? Have I had it being uh, fixed, you know, in between um, services? So for some people, they'll say, I'm just not interested in spending eight, $9,000 on a new machine. Also, the space that um, the reprocessing takes up. So for those of you who've, you know, who think, look, I'm going to have to find a room to do this, but is that a consulting room that we're taking up? Is that a, um, a storage area that we really need? Would it be better just to go disposable? Um, the uh, training time for staff, supervising, uh, recording, all of those things. Now, if you say, well, you know, I'm still not convinced, um, I don't know which way to go, I think the clincher is your throughput. That is, how much am I actually reprocessing each day? Can I justify spending thousands and thousands of dollars if I, well, you're certainly going to spend a few thousand if you're going to buy a washer disinfectant sometime in the, in the future, um, where am I going to put that? Oh, I'll have to have a new room. So can I justify that? That's going to depend on that throughput. So if I remove bowls and dishes from the equation, um, those you can wash without necessarily um, um, sterilising, as long as they're only used for receiving used items, which are not, you know, obviously going to go back to the patient, then you're left with essentially the instruments. And so you would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing three loads a week. I would really question whether it's worth sterilising, whether I should go disposable. But they are only the decisions that a practice can make. I can't make that decision. For some people, it's very easy. They say, look, really, by the time we've got separate room, we've got a trained staff, we've got all the consumables, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we're already using a load of disposables. Our instrument, tra uh, our dressing trays are all disposable. Um, so much of what we have is disposable. Our cervical smear stuff's all disposable. And, you know, we're only using a couple of pairs of scissors and, and a scalpel blade each day. We're going to go fully disposable. That's a decision that practices can make. 
Again, they can then add up the cost of those you're going to have to have maybe some storage space. But could I suggest that even if you're going to go ahead and reprocess your reusable instruments, that you still keep some stock um, stock of disposable instruments. You know, just for that Friday when you're flat out, you haven't got time to do a load, or there's an emergency and you've got your disposable. So I actually encourage people to have a few disposables on hand. Um, anyway, so already practices use a lot of disposable items, um, consumables, uh, etc. Now, the disposable instruments, you know, the um, they've often got a painted handle. That's one way you can um, work out if there's if they've got into the wrong, you know, if they've got into the reusable. Uh, a sterilising area. And this is what some of the practices tell me, that sometimes we come to do the instrument um, cleaning and we find that there are some disposables put in there. Well, that's about saying to the staff, if it's got a coloured handle, um, green or blue usually, and I know that some aren't, they've just got a tiny little two engraved in them with a cross through it, meaning no second use. So today there should really be a big scramble to make sure that there is no reuse of disposable items. Single use, disposable, no way. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, single patient use items um, in a minute, but really we are tending to go disposable single use rather than reusing things on the same patient. The patient sure might have their same um, asthma spacer um, and so practices tend to just get the patient to bring their spacer or you can get disposable spaces. Lots and lots of practices are using disposable spaces. Um, and so really just having less coming to you. So how can you minimise what you need to reprocess and then assess, do I actually still want to keep reprocessing? That I think is the question uh, that practices need to ask. So let's say you're thinking, oh, the next thing I really want to know is where do these disposable instruments come from? How are they made? Well, in fact, they're usually already recycled metal. So there are ships that are decommissioned and sold for scrap, I think would be the term used. And these are actually, the metal is taken apart and um, I can't say 100%, but I am told that most instruments come from that recycling of the old ships. Okay, and so what it is, it's a low grade steel. It doesn't mean it's poor. Poor grade is low grade, so it's not as stainless as your stainless steel instruments that you do reprocess. So it is, in fact, already recycled metal, if that helps. Um, I can't add up the volumes of water that are used in the production of them. But what I can tell you is the disposable instruments can't be cleaned. You'll often see a little screw in there. Well, you can't access that with a brush, et cetera. They are, the metal ones with sharp points are disposed to sharps waste. And sharps waste is the most expensive type of disposal. So there's landfill, there's um, treatment in the plant with chlorine for ordinary clinical waste, and then some of them use heat. And then for the sharps, they have to grind them up and chlorinate them. So it is the most intensive. Um, and you know, you can say unenvironmental. If I have a look at remaining with um, reprocessing of reusable items, I've got to think about heating up the steriliser. If you want to get really picky, you can talk about the manufacturer of the steriliser, you know, which is steel, et cetera. Um, then you would talk about the water, heating up the water, the power that runs it, all that kind of stuff. And again, um, I there are hospitals that have done evaluations and they have come to the conclusion that any instrument that's used up on a ward can be disposable. This is some hospitals, but instruments used in theatre all go down to what we call CSSD. So they've actually determined that it's, it's more costly to try and get the odd instrument from a ward down to CSSD at random times using porters to bring things down and getting them cleaned in a timely manner. They've actually worked out it's, it's easier to, for those to be disposable and they've actually done that cost analysis. 
So I don't sort of buy into that. Um, Having said that, I think about 25% will continue to reprocess going into the future. I think that a lot of the skin clinics will expand and will go for that dedicated, you know, and probably already have gone for the dedicated room and um, may even offer for a price to take on some of the instrument reprocessing for nearby clinics. So that's what I wanted to talk about in terms of a choice uh, for the future. So having, ha having given you a little synopsis about the requirements and the space and, you know, the washer disinfector eventually, um, depending on what the Australian standards come down in their final version in the next, I think it'll be about September. I think the last comment is due in, in early August, but I'm, I'm, I, I think that they'll say it's going to be mandatory to use a washer disinfector. So having said that, and having, I guess, put you on a path as to how to assess, you know, is my throughput worth it? Would I be better off getting disposables? Um, and I've told you a little bit about how the disposables are made, where they come from. I guess what I didn't talk about, which is often an argument put to me, we don't like, we don't like them. We don't like their quality. And when I say to the person, but you already use them. <laughs> when was the last time you used the one that you didn't like? And they might have been, I don't know, tweezers or forceps. But I, I don't think people have problems with tweezers and forceps. It could be artery forceps. It could be scissors, et cetera. So what um, a recommendation of mine is to actually call, your supply, call a few suppliers of the different brands, and there are various brands, um, actually get... Uh, a couple of samples. Uh, now, they may not arrive sterile, so don't use them on a patient, but, um, you know, use them on an orange or something like that and um, and see what they're like. So often that argument is uh, people might have used those many years ago, five, six, seven years ago. So get a few of the different brands. However, I need to say that the different brands tend to say to me that they all come from the same source but I think people need to discover that for themselves. So get some freebies and uh, actually check to see what the uh, the quality is like. And I'm, I mean, years ago, um, one of the um, doctors said to me that she was actually importing um, vaginal speculae from Canada because the quality was better than what she could get here. So hopefully those days have gone and uh, people have got good quality vaginal speculae. However, I also um, respect the fact that some reusable, uh, some of the reprocessable speculae uh, may be superior for certain uh, situations. The choices for the future. So I just referred to, apart from going fully disposable or keeping with, repro with reprocessing on site, there is that choice of things being removed and being processed elsewhere. The two issues there are transport, who's going to do it, that's extra time, what's the charge going to be? Um, and then the other part of the other aspect is, but when I finish with this item, what do I have to do with it? And how long is it going to be before it's taken off to the other clinic? Because you see, you might end up in the same position having to clean it, which is, you know, a lot of the processing, a lot of the reprocessing. Um, so unless the skin clinic is next door or, um, yeah, next door almost or a part of even your uh, facility, um, I would think that's harder to get around. Certainly the days of putting it in a taxi, the instruments in a taxi and sending them out are probably just not that practical. Um, having said that, there may be certain sets that you use occasionally of instruments um, that you want to hang on to and it is worth, you, you, know, you might only use them once a month and you have found a clinic that will process that for you, a skin clinic. So for me, I think that the choices, you can actually use a couple of choices all within your practice. So you have some disposables on hand, for when you need them, for when the steriliser's broken down or you've become ridiculously busy or the doctor's going out to do a home visit or assessment or something like that, um, or you might have that special set 
that you want to hang on to and it's fabulous and the skin clinic down the road will reprocess that and then in the meantime you've decided to go disposable. Um, so they hopefully wrapping that up would be being a bit clearer about the requirements but knowing that there's going to be um, some decision made later this year as to whether it will be mandatory to use a mechanical form of cleaning. And remember, be positive about this um, progress because it means we can confirm that we're cleaning the instrument and that is critical. So the requirement, I think for a lot of practices, it's the space and they just go, I don't wanna be doing that. For others, it's look, we're doing three loads a day wow, that's 15 loads a week and we're going to expand. Definitely worth considering, um, you know, improving the, um, the outcome there. And then for those practices, which we're going to talk about um, in the next session, what can I do in the meantime to actually improve what I'm doing before I, you know, make my final decision? So I was going to leave it there and think of this as more a fireside chat. Um, and it is about the items that come to the reprocessing area. But certainly, please go to this section 10 and have a really good read of it. I'd hope that everybody's had a read of it before we do our, se our second session. So thank you. I think that's just a, a 35 minute, but I think I've given you enough to chew there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching us. And I just wanted to say that if after this webinar you still decided to uh, follow through instrument processing, we invite you to attend a webinar which we're going to run on Tuesday, 11th of July. Um, and it will be instrument reprocessing in general practice. You will have some more practical tips and uh, you can check if you're doing the things right if you're doing it now or if you're thinking about it. Thank you very much. One issue that practices do uh, mention is what about the ultrasonic cleaner? And I haven't mentioned that to date. So the ultrasonic cleaner is what we call the pre-clean. And so that is actually before you do any manual scrubbing. And I will talk more about that in the, in the next session. But yes, where you're using... Um, an ultrasonic cleaner, you would need to be reporting that it's passing its soil load test each day too. But a lot of people think it's um, it goes after the scrubbing and it doesn't. It actually goes at the start and then, uh, then the item is cleaned or put into the washer disinfector. Uh, some washer disinfectors have an ultrasonic uh, cleaning, an ultrasonic phase. So Apologies for having missed that, um, but we will talk about that more in the next session. Thank you.